is a chosen one. She alone will stand against the vampires, the demons, and the forces of darkness. She is the Slayer. I know what you're after. That's not what I'm looking for. Hey, you forgot your steak. He, he prepares her. Prepares me for what? For getting kicked out of school? For losing all of my friends? For having to spend all of my time fighting for my life and never getting to tell anyone because I might endanger them? Go ahead. Prepare me. I think boys are more interested in a girl who can talk. You really haven't been dating lately. From now on, I'm only going to hang out with the living. I mean, lively. People. Okay. Life is short. Life is short. Not original, I'll grant you, but it's true, you know? Why waste time being all shy and worrying about some guy and if he's gonna laugh at you? Seize the moment, because tomorrow you might be dead. Oh, well, that's nice. The harvest. Did he say anything else? Something about the mouth of hell. I really didn't like him. A vampire in love with a slayer. It's rather poetic. In a maudlin sort of way. First off, we need to put some respect on the intro song because, wow, nothing gets you more hyped. Honestly, why aren't more songs like this? It's so good. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is one of the most iconic shows of the 90s and early 2000s and uh, still has a very active fan base now, which is kind of why I'm actually doing this series of videos, which <laughs> originally was going to be two, but now it looks like it's going to be four because my script for season one was just getting far too long. Now, speaking of that, please, I'm only just starting to watch season four and I want to watch this in proper order, so um, please do not put any spoilers. Since we're going with season by season, let's just make this fun for everyone and keep the spoilers just to see season one so then everybody can enjoy the comment section. Thanks! And I'll also probably be having the last of this out in December which I know won't fit spooky season anymore but um, I work full time so there's only so much that uh, I can actually do. Joss Whedon. Now we have to address the huge elephant in the room because um, I don't think he's a good person, okay? Now I'm not going to be mentioning this in the other videos, I just want to address it here because this is definitely an issue. He's been exposed as being allegedly legal reasons, allegedly the biggest hypocrite that you could ever have seen, uh, creating amazing feminist content and then actually being, you know, kind of a misogynist. He's been accused of being verbally abusive, calling women fat when they're pregnant, he's been cheated on his ex-wife numerous times and it's all linked in the articles down below including from Cordelia like the actress who played Cordelia her name's Charisma and she shared her experience because she was so scared that she kept silent for ages because this is what happens okay so he had a bit of a vendetta against her um easy to say from what she shared from her experience and it does make the writing of Cordelia make a lot more sense because as the seasons have gone on I've just noticed things being more vengeful for her and I'm coming from like the start of season four. This is a real shame because undeniably Buffy is a great show with amazing messaging which I found myself applauding and then just huge ick factor. So if you want to try defending Joss Whedon in the comments, um, you're clearly not in the right space. We are here for human rights on this channel, so you can leave your hate comment, dislike and leave, I don't really care. The thing is that you can be a fan of something and critique it at the same time. I'm not really here for the whole stan culture mindset. If you've seen any of my other deep dives, you'll know that I actually do this all the time. You can appreciate something and then also critique it and ask for more. I think that that is a very healthy perspective to have on things as opposed to just being, you know, everything's in this rose-tinted glasses sort of way, you know? Anyway, there are some trigger warnings for this video, including choreographed violence, um, fake blood, very obvious body doubles, um, quite serious um, issues that we will be discussing around sexual assault and rape and those sorts of connotations and controlling manipulation relationships oh, and also fat phobia and slut shaming if you are familiar with the show then you'll know the sort of themes that I want to talk about now I won't be talking about every single episode in this but I am going chronological order I will have the episode at the bottom so then you'll know which episode I'm talking about um, because I think that that could be helpful for you but I'm not going to dive into every single one I'm just going to dive into the ones that I want to because this is my channel and this is going to take me a lot of work to do 
Season one. First off, I just need to appreciate the costume design here by this wonderful person here because season one and two, basically um, everything amazing to do with the 90s is in these two seasons and Buffy is wearing them. <laughs> There's a few cute outfits that Cordelia wears as well and a couple from Willow too, but I just have to call it out honestly iconic and also I really like the styling of Angel. Episode 1, I know that I'm a sucker but I really did like the whole subverting the trope of the man being predatory to the woman and then she's the one that turns against him and uh, sucks his blood out. I don't know what to tell you, she's a bit of a feminist boss babe even though she's actually working for kind of the devil. Then Buffy is having some nightmares and I've got to tell you as someone who has suffered from horrific nightmares since before I can even remember, um, if that means that you're a special person and that you're or a chosen one. I've never been told by a weird English librarian that I've got special places to go in the world. I've never received a letter telling me that I'm a witch. I've never had any of that. That's a bit disappointing. So Buffy starts at her new school and this happens. Excuse me? You may want to come up with your pitchforks already, but I don't like Xander. Basically, he just objectifies people, he lusts after Buffy, he's incredibly controlling. This introduction, how this happens, that's him for the entirety of season one. That's all that I've seen him as objectifying, being pretty sexist, and also using Willow. Can you help me out tonight, please? Be my study buddy. Well, what's in it for me? A shiny nickel. I haven't really seen much to the contrary, even in season four. Kate, okay, look, you can have your own opinion. I'm just counting him as one of those quote unquote nice guys. If you know me, you know that I hope that everyone can learn, change, and grow, and there are actually characters in this show that show that. Um, but Xander, not so much. When Buffy meets the principal, I quite like him because he tears up her old record, which of course he pieces back together after finding out that she actually burnt down like the school gymnasium, but it was full of vampires at the time, so like we can understand, right? Um, but that whole notion about having a clean slate and giving people second chances, really appreciate that. We should have that in more schools and all sorts of things, honestly. I think that this is something that is kind of lacking, is allowing people a bit of space to grow and listen and change. Willow! Nice dress! Good to know you've seen the softer side of Sears. Willow, right? Why? I, I mean, hi. Uh, did you want me to move? Why don't we start with, hi, I'm Buffy. And uh, then let's segue directly into me asking you for a favor. It doesn't involve moving, but it does involve hanging out with me for a while. But aren't you hanging out with Cordelia? I can't do both. Not legally. <sighs> Willow, sweet Willow. She must be protected at all costs. She's always doing things that are like out of her way to be too nice to other people. And oh, sorry if you can hear the dog barking outside. I can't control my neighbors. I love Willow, okay? I think that she is not only sweet, but also like, I, I really like her character growth that I've been seeing. When the drained guy falls out of the locker and Buffy confronts Giles, um, I love the speech that she gave. Honestly, this is probably the best pilot that you could have had because it introduces all of the characters well, we get people's motives very clearly, we get everything that we need. We love a good reluctant hero. Sometimes when heroes want to be heroes, um, just like I doubt some people when they go into politics, it's like, what's the real reason <laughs> that you're doing this? Hi, I'm an enormous slut. Hello, would you like a copy of The Watchtower? There's also an exceptional amount of slut shaming and fat shaming in this show. It does get worse as you get towards the 2000s, which um, I haven't made a three-part series on for no reason. The 2000s was rife with this, because I definitely noticed a shift when I actually went to season four. I know that this is a relic of its time when it comes to those sorts of mindsets, but it did feel really ill-fitting for the show that's actually meant to be about badass women um, who can kick butt in like high heels and a miniskirt and even a beautiful prom dress, you know? Um, it's it just felt really weird. It's like the only way that you can be a good person is if you're a hot, skinny virgin, and that's it. There's definite slut shaming that happens, mainly targeted as well at Cordelia. We meet Angel in episode one as well, and she kicks his butt. I know what you're thinking. Don't worry. I don't bite me. The chemistry? Sizzling. Sparks were flying off my screen. What I want is to be left alone. Do you really think that's an option anymore? You're standing at the mouth of hell, and it's about to open. Don't turn your back on this. 
And also he gave her jewellery to protect her like straight away. I had to wait a month for the jewellery that I got from Brandon. I don't know if everybody else has noticed this, but Willow is eating raisins at the bronze. The fact the female vampire's name is Dala just made me think of this from Finding Nemo. <laughs> that was all I could think of any time she said her name. I'm the bad guy. Duh. Hopefully you've all noticed this as well, but in season one, the vampire teeth are so ill-fitting on most of the characters, they can barely talk. It only gets like better when we're in like late season three for some people. And I just feel so sorry for the actors because even when we get later on you can see them actually try to talk and like push them up when they have to keep closing their mouths because they don't fit well. To round out the episode you do actually have to show the danger and of course set the premise for the entire point of the show which is fighting against the Hellmouth and the dangers which are actually starting to lurk up from it because it's become more powerful. And you do get to of course see Buffy kick some ass but her power also still needs to grow and she needs to learn a whole bunch of lessons which is what this entire first season is about. The fact that she pushes people away, she tries to be too independent, she thinks too highly of herself and also having to accept this responsibility that she's kept on trying to push away and actually embrace the friendships around her as opposed to trying to be a loner. Which leads me on to... Episode 2. So being a vampire is like being part of a cult, therefore Angel leaving is like being an ex-cult member, which could lead to all sorts of other connotations if you want to take it down that sort of theoretical path. Willow's ability to hack into things and her intelligence in these first two seasons, I really appreciate it. It's not put across in a way of like a Not My Other Girls vibe, but in a way of just appreciating this kind of awkward-ish book smarty girl, um, not in a way to pit her against others. And I, I do appreciate that. I do want to help. I need to. Well, then help me. I've been researching this harvest affair. It seems to be some sort of preordained massacre. Rivers of blood, hell on earth. Quite charmless. Why was he standing so close to Buffy and then also over Willow, like this demon being? I... It's just weird choices. I knew you'd figure out this entryway sooner or later. Actually, I thought it was gonna be a little sooner. Are you popping up with this cryptic wise man act on a regular basis? Can you at least tell me your name? Angel. Angel. It's a pretty name. Don't go down there. Angel's so snarky in these first few episodes, and is it wrong of me to kind of like him with that edge? It probably is, isn't it? It's probably wrong of me. Um, because he also turns into the biggest puppy dog. You know what it's like to have a friend. I wasn't supposed to be a stumper. And just melts your heart. I don't know. Have I met anyone that doesn't like Angel? I don't think so. But then why did I have a crush on Spike later? Of course, Cordelia wants to ruin Buffy's name at school, so that is exactly what she does. And we have this established obnoxious blonde girl um, who is going to turn up later on and I actually forgot completely about her until I rewatched for this video to record the clips. And Willow trying to defend Buffy is so sweet. An iconic intro scene is discovered. Do other people do this as well when you actually look out for like the scenes that show in the intro? I always do that no matter what show it is. I'm like, oh that was in the show and I'm a bit like that meme basically but I hope I'm not alone with that. My poor neighbor's dog. Don't know what they're doing. I just think they've just left him outside. Buffy sneaks out to hunt vampires and I snuck out to go to parties. Same, same. And you know how you tell someone's just turned into a vampire? Because they have a cool aspect to them, like their hair gets slicked back and they wear something like a leather jacket. Key identifiers. Confidence? Cool. There you go. You know how in like American teen movies they have that moment where people are having a normal house party and then a whole bunch of people crash it? That's literally what the vampires do and um, start causing a bit of chaos so of course some people have to step up and kick some butt. But also the most dramatic death of a non-main character vampire ever, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's in about nine hours, moron. No! On the end of the first episode, before they go to the whole to be continued thing, oh my goodness, the cheesy 90s-ness of it, oh, the after-school special music. Well, I'll never forget it, none of it. Good. 
Next time you'll be prepared. Next time? Next time is why? Well, we prevented the master from freeing himself and opening the mouth of hell. Not to say he's going to stop trying. I'd say the fun is just beginning. But I expect a certain amount of responsibility, and instead of which you en enslave yourself to this, this cult. You don't like the colour? Episode 3, the cheerleader episode. I actually really like this one, though I've seen some people online not like it. And I'm like, have you never had... Um, maybe they're not women, um, but the expectations of a parent being put onto the child to the point of corruption and stealing someone's life in order to fulfill their own dream of their own glory days. I thought that this was done incredibly well in this episode. She was the best. And I can't get my body to move like hers. I choked in there so bad. No, Amy, you did fine. I'm gonna get you. Wait, no! Um, but also, I really have to point out some of the really terrible shots. I'm not gonna include them, um, or I'll at least censor it, because you open the episode with a woman lunging directly in front of the camera, so it's like this arch, and I'm just hit. Why? Why? Ooh, stretchy. Where was I? And then, of course, you got Xander perving at the girls. And then when Buffy actually rescues a girl who had a spell cast on her to be on fire, they do an upskirt shot of Buffy as she jumps over her to put the fire out. And I'm just here, like, there were other angles that you could have gone to. Why? I didn't get it, really, because cheerleaders are meant to wear, like, chair shorts under their chair skirts. You know? Some of the weight stuff gets brought up in this as well about the controlling parent things and as I have seen and spoken to people about actually in a whole host of my videos this is definitely an issue that many girls in particular have had to deal with. There are forums dedicated to it, um, it's, it's really disgusting and so it's good to have actually had that represented. Even though Willow does compliment her by saying you've lost a lot of weight. You lost a lot of weight. Had to. But that is a toxic thing that people still do to this day. If someone loses weight, then it's definitely a good thing and it's like... Sometimes there's bad reasons for that, okay? Not all of it is intentional in a good way. Cordelia's again shown to be a mean, spiteful, popular girl. Are we surprised? No. If your supreme clutchiness out there today takes me out of the running, you're gonna be so very beyond sorry. Have a nice day. It's really funny seeing our first witch as being evil, considering how things, you know, transpire in the show. Um, I'm glad that they stopped making them so evil because, if you don't know me, I am a fan of witches here. <laughs> did anybody else have a Mean Girls flashback moment with this? Because I most certainly did. And shove it right up your hairy- <laughs> Xander checking out the witchy books in order to actually look at, um, body parts of women. Um, I know people may be trying to type in the comment section, there's just a teenage boy thing to do, and I'm also here, like, we're on episode three, we're trying to establish the characters. If you're just trying to tell me that he's a perv, that's already been established enough. Um, this isn't making him into a great person, but whatever. And also, I really like how this episode cemented just how much Giles is willing to sacrifice in order to save Buffy. Um, you could see him in physical pain in order to do this, and I like the end messaging. I gave up my life so you could drag that worthless carcass around and call it living. You've never been anything but trouble. I'm going to put you where you can make trouble again. Guess what? I feel better. Then Amy goes to live with her dad and has the best life and the ultimate vengeance is served. Creepy CGI, creepy CGI, creepy CGI. Episode four, Xander's fantasy of being the hero to Buffy and her being subservient to him. Xander, you've got a little. This is the one where he falls for the bug that wants to eat him, which is entirely skippable. Angel turns up and he gives her his jacket. He'll just give me a cryptic warning about some exciting new catastrophe and then disappear into the night. Right? You're cold. You can take it. Me. Look cold. And I know, I know that I shouldn't find this as charming as I do, but there is still nothing sweeter than when you're cold and 
someone gives you their jacket it's just the nicest thing i i still like brandon and i have been together for nearly 10 years now when he does that for me i still get butterflies the only other messaging that could really be pulled from this episode would be predatory teachers and predatory people towards teenagers but i think that in a later episode they actually tackle this in a far more realistic way Episode 5, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date. This one felt a bit of a filler as well, but I do like how Willow is starting to come out of her shell because of her friendship with Buffy, and you can actually see that. You can see her getting more vivacious as the season carries on going. She's a lot less trying to please, and I think that that's really good. I really like Buffy and Willow's relationship. And I also like this moment where Giles is building up this huge battle and then nothing happens. The dark forces are aligning against us and we have a chance to beat them back. Tonight, we go into battle. Xander just proves himself to be a piece of scum once again because he tries to control the way that Buffy is dressing to go on a date with a guy that she likes. Oh wow, um, we love that. Oh, and also preemptively slut-shaming her. Um, Wow, if you're meant to be her friend, aren't you meant to defend that? Overcoat and a ski cap. The ear flaps will bring out your eyes. Which one do you think Owen will like better? The red or the peach? Oh, you mean for kissing you and then telling all of his friends how easy you are so the whole school loses respect for you and then talks behind your back. The red's fine. Thanks. I'll go with the peach. And then they ask him to turn around so that she can get changed, but look what he's doing. He's trying to angle the mirror so he can pervert her. Wow, unconsensual, disgusting. Um, sorry, defenders? Really? Really? And Cordelia, again, is just established to be evil and judgmental and powerful and popular. And Angel pops up trying to get Buffy to kill the bad guys and gets jealous puppy dog eyes. But... Do note that he isn't being possessive, he isn't being weird, he is respecting the fact that Buffy is leading a separate life, he's trying to make sure that that's okay, but it is undeniable about the fact that he has feelings for her. That's established. There are two different ways about going about this. The Angel way is comparatively a hell of a lot better to the Xander way, okay? And I also like how Buffy is quite astute with the fact that she realised that Owen only wanted to actually be with her for the fact that she could kick people's butts and it was like an adrenaline rush for him and it's like, no, she actually just wants to live a normal life and just wants some chill time. It doesn't want everything to be about that. And that's one of the things that she pushes back when it comes to Angel is most of their conversations are about the duties as opposed to them. Episode 6 with the hyena transformation. Again, I didn't really enjoy this one too much, but it definitely does go to dark places. These are bullies that we've never seen until now, and we they never show up ever again. Evil dodgeball. That's all you need to know about this episode is evil dodgeball. Willow's crush on Xander. This is a proximity crush and something that happens to kids and teenagers. I'm sure that you've had a proximity crush in your life. This is just what I'm calling it. It's just when you're around someone that's sort of like in your friendship circle or around you. And of course you get a crush on them because hormones are all weird. Uh, she can do so much better. And plus I don't understand any relationship between them genuinely other than friendship. Friendship, I can see that working. And it does, obviously. But relationship, no. Will I trying to talk to Buffy about Angel is so sweet and I love to see how much Buffy tries to fight it and it's like, mm, sweetie. Oh, in this episode they also eat the principal and the pig. Poor pig, by the way. First off being put in that hideous costume and then also that. Um, but what a way to write off a character is to have them eaten by hyenas. Oh, when Joey on Days of Our Lives and Friends, he gets shoved down, falls down the elevator shaft and that's how he dies. It just made me think of that exact same moment. I'm like, this is probably one of the most humiliating ways to get ridden out of show. But when Xander comes back to normal, he does try to save Willow, which I'm sure people will say is um, him redeeming himself entirely. Not quite. What about Angel? Angel? I to see him in a relationship. Hi, honey, you're in grave danger. I'll see you next month. Episode 7, the angel episode. You cannot skip this one. <sighs> and then Xander bumps into Cordelia and woo, their relationship is apparently blossoming through antagonism? Okay, healthy relationship. Start. And I don't want to play games. Show, Show yourself. yourself. 
Buffy comes up against a bunch of really hard vampires, like harder than what she's ever fought yet, and Angel comes to save her, um, of course with cheesy one-liners. Good dogs don't fight. But of course the other vampires can't enter the house, which leaves Angel and Buffy alone. Ooh, oh my goodness. Again, the chemistry between them both, palpable, zinging off the screen. You're the mystery guy that appears out of nowhere. I'm not saying I'm not happy about it tonight, but if you are hanging around, I'd like to know why. Maybe I like you. And then, of course, he gets to meet her mom. Nice to meet you. What do you do, Angel? He's a student. Why are you always lying? Now, notice when Buffy needs to get changed and she asks him to turn around. He doesn't actually peek. He just stays turned around. He... he you know how there's this whole trope of even good guys have to peek? Like, doesn't matter what superhero you are, you always have to peek? No. Angel's a gentleman. Actually just is like, you don't want this? Boundary has been set. I'm not going to cross that boundary. <clears throat> Xander. Do you snore? I don't know. It's been a long time since anybody's been in a position to let me know. And of course Xander is never convinced because of course he's just jealous and mopey and just wants to control and possess Buffy. Did you uh, I mean did he uh, perfect gentleman. Buffy, come on, wake up and smell the seduction, it's the oldest trick in the book. What? Saving my life? Getting slashed in the ribs? Duh. The anointed one being a child, like I get it, but also the child actor is so bad. Her weapons training cracks me up as well because Giles is like a cup of tea made in bone china that has been brewed for too long. It's just this nervous, fragile energy. And I really like Buffy and Giles' relationship. I like their dynamic. I think it's good. They both learn from each other. Good. Let's move on to the crossbow. Because when I am... Hey, no big water. Over the bridge, under the bridge, over the dam, I want to I kiss you. Kiss me? I'm older than you and this can't ever... I better go. The warnings about Angel wanting to be with Buffy but knowing he shouldn't be. Ooh, I love a good bit of foreshadowing. Okay. This passionate kiss, of course, revealing he is indeed a vampire with, I'm sorry, this made me crack up every single time that I've watched this. The worst exit from a building I think we have ever seen. <laughs> you go from this like really intense passionate moment to oh my god betrayal to just this. A vampire ever be a good person or couldn't it happen? A vampire isn't a person at all. It, it may have the movements, the, the memories, even the personality of the person that it took over but it, it, it's still a demon at the core. Oh and what does Xander do? He yells at Buffy. Um, of course he does. Um, Sorry if there's defenders out there, I'm still not on your side. And you know, he meets his ex. Well, one of them, you know, Dala. You're living above ground, like one of them. You and your new friend are attacking us, like one of them. You're not one of them. Are you? No, but I'm not exactly one of you either. Is that what you tell yourself these days? I know that this is bad, but I kind of love how much she relishes in being evil. Don't forget that Angel is like a vegetarian version of a vampire, which Verily Bitchy has actually made fantastic videos on vampires. If you are at all interested, I really do recommend that channel. I've recommended it before a few times and I'm still going to keep on recommending it because you should check out their work. Angel's trouble pass and his redemption arc is being revealed and I know that this whole broody, dark, mysterious man thing is like overplayed as a trope or whatever but I still think it's done well in this show, okay? I do, I genuinely do. Angel kills her and comes back to the fold. Angel, he was the most vicious creature I ever met. I miss him. But of course the master misses him and his amazing skills and so what does Dala do but set him up? Sure it's the simplest setup but then you have the betrayal setup and you have the temptation setup and you mean that his relationship is completely over, he's got nowhere else to go. Super simple, very effective, easy, breezy, beautiful, the vampire way. You're not welcome here. You come near us and I'll kill you. I invited you into my home and then you attacked my family. Why not? 
I killed mine. I killed their friends and their friends' children. For a hundred years, I offered an ugly death to everyone I met. And I did it with a song in my heart. And we find out about Angel's curse from the gypsies, which makes this whole torment he's constantly dealing with make a lot more sense. The elders conjured the perfect punishment for me. When you become a vampire, the demon takes your body, but it doesn't get your soul. That's gone. No conscience, no remorse. It's an easy way to live. You have no idea what it's like to have done the things I've done. And to care. I haven't fed on a living human being since that day. Think about a trust exercise, oh my god. The big bad guy, the master being shown as being so fragile as well is absolutely hilarious. After this amazing battle scene because we find out that Darla was the one that turned angel. But he's the one that stakes her in the end and has to deal with that reckoning of uh, unaliving someone that he used to love. Look, this can't ever be anything. I know. For one thing, you're like 224 years older than I am. I just gotta... I gotta walk away from this. The age difference between them is huge. Um, it's not pleasant, this age difference. Does it mean that in this fictional show I don't still enjoy their chemistry together? No. Is that probably a problem on my side? Yeah, it probably is a problem on my side. I don't know what else to tell you other than I'm glad that it gets brought up quite a few times. Episode 8, fully skippable in my books except for this intro scene where a priest asks a demon to come. I find this hilarious. Sorry, my humour is very immature. But of course Miss Calendar gets introduced here and I love Miss Calendar. I love her. Jenny Calendar is amazing. I love her fashion as well, and she is just so self-assured. I'll be back in the Middle Ages. Did you ever leave? And I love her relationship with Giles. I think that, oh, amazing. Ms. Calendar, I'm sure your computer science class is fascinating. I happen to believe that one can survive in modern society without being a slave to the um, idiot box. That's TV. The idiot box is TV. This is the good box. I still prefer a good book. And we also see future incels, which is <laughs> great to see. The printed page is obsolete. Information isn't bound up anymore. It's an entity. The only reality is virtual. This episode basically just shows all of parents' fears about the internet because people like Willow get taken under the spell of someone and, you know, you never know if you're talking to a cat on the internet, all that stuff. Down, girl. Let's focus here, okay? What do you actually know about this guy? Oh, see, I knew you'd react like this. Again, it's kind of skippable. There's just a few funny moments in here that I wanted to show you. The divine exists in cyberspace, same as out here. Are you a witch? Hmm, I don't have that kind of power. Techno-pagan is the term. Um, and also Willow's starting to grow a backbone at the end of this, which... I like. This is the first time I've actually seen her like do something more action-oriented. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's life on the hell now. Let's face it, none of us are ever going to have a happy, normal relationship. We're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> episode 9, which is the puppet show, which I don't really want to talk about all that much. It's kind of a filler episode, really. But Principal Snyder is introduced, you know, our evil principal. Buffy's leopard print dress is shown, which is an amazing look, which I would love to be able to recreate. And there is this one line exchange from Xander and Cordelia I have to include. What I can think is, it could have been me. We can dream. But none of this means that a relationship between them should happen. If you want to snuggle up and come me. So that horny dummy thing really isn't an act, is it? Nope. Yuck. Episode 10. Nightmares coming true. Can I just say that none of you would survive if my nightmares actually came true? My god. The cursed child made people's nightmares and everything come true. 
um, and the messaging of facing your fears, this does actually serve a narrative purpose for Buffy's journey, for everyone's journeys in this show, which is why I like this episode so much. Um, and I do like how Willow's outfits are getting more colourful as the show goes on, as she comes out of her shell more. Okay, let's pause at this scene, look inside Willow's locker. Um, she's been friends with Buffy and Xander for ages at this point. And who does she have a picture of with in her locker? It's the librarian, it's Giles. A, a printed picture of Willow and Giles in her locker. N none of her other friends, just the librarian. And with the nightmares coming true, like, Buffy's dad saying this stuff. I think that every single child of divorce um, understands these feelings and has gone through these feelings themselves. It was you. Me? Having you. Raising you. Seeing you every day. I mean, do you have any idea what that's like? Rude and you're not nearly as bright as I thought you were going to be. <laughs> I mean, Buffy, let's be honest. Could you stand to live in the same house with a daughter like that? Yeah, the writing is very after-school special, but at the same time, this does speak to her abandonment issues and one of her main fears. So yeah, I do get it, even if the writing could have been a lot better along with the acting, but he does get recast in season two, so don't worry about that. Xander's first fear is pretty standard, turning up somewhere naked. Now, riddle me this, have you ever had this nightmare? Because I've had basically every single nightmare under the sun, and I've never spoken to anyone that's had this nightmare. I've only ever seen this represented in movies, TV shows, or written about in books. So you tell me, is this actually real? Because I am convinced it's not. Cordelia's fear is her hair turning into a very cheap Party City wig, and Willow's fear is cultural appropriation then being made to sing on screen in front of an audience, even though she actually just was in the talent show in front of a bunch of people. But that's okay, whatever. But I do like the singer that <laughs> she's against, like the opera singer, their reaction. Daddy. My turn. <laughs> I like this a lot just because I'm here for a lot of sass. I also do understand Xander being scared of clowns, and I like the way that he actually stood up to him at the end, and I think that, that was done well. Good on Xander. I appreciated that. <laughs> You are a lousy clown. Your balloon animals were pathetic. Everyone can make a giraffe. But Giles' is fear? Ooh, you feel this one. You feel this in your little heart. You really do. Of it failing Buffy, of the fact that he wasn't able to teach her enough, wasn't able to be there for her. I'm sorry. I am free because you fear it. Because you fear it, the world is crumbling. Which leads to the grand reveal of Buffy's ultimate failure, the fact that she couldn't actually defeat the Master, and not only that, but has become the thing that she's meant to slay, a vampire. So all of her fears have now come true. After they help Billy defeat the Ugly Man, they meet the real reason, who is a baseball coach. Imagine that. The super toxic pressure that could be put on children, yet again. This is a theme which does come up a few times in the show, and I do appreciate it. And it's the one time that some sort of justice gets served, even though it wouldn't happen in reality. It's still nice to give kids, like, a little fantasy that, hey, you know what? Adults will be held accountable, which most often doesn't happen. Episode 11, Out of Mind, Out of Sight. When Buffy's bag spills on the floor, I think that all women actually carry this stuff around in their bags these days. Don't be shaming people that have to, like, defend themselves if it gets the fact that we're facing the patriarchy every day and men have been emboldened to just attack women if they look at them differently or don't look at them at all. I do like how Buffy's separation is highlighted with the fact that she used to be really cool and then she can't even fit in with the uncool kids, she can't fit in with the cool kids, like her life got flipped, turned upside down as you would say, after she became a slayer. And her not knowing where to fit in, her not knowing who she can turn to, is just a theme that is carried on throughout this whole show very well I think. This episode really is very much an after-school special. It's pretty skippable, honestly. It's just about when someone is constantly overlooked, made to feel invisible, made to feel like they don't count, and then they lash out against that, and the messaging is very over the top. It's pretty skippable, like I said. But we do get some of Cordelia's backstory here, so we can actually see that she's got potential for growth. It's not like any of them really know me. I don't even know if they like me half the time. People just want to be in the popular zone. Sometimes when I'm talk, everyone's so busy agreeing with me, they don't hear a word I say. Well, if you feel so alone, then why do you work so hard at being popular? 
Well, it beats being alone all by yourself. It's the final days! My time has come, glory! Glory! What do you think? The finale, episode 12, Prophecy Girl. And also Buffy confronts Giles with the fact that she broke a nail as well. Um, relatable. Look, I broke a nail, okay? I'm wearing a press on. The least you could do is exhibit some casual interest. Oh, and of course Xander confesses his feelings to Buffy and can't handle it. Wow, she actually spoke really well. Her reasons were entirely valid. Xander, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't think of you that way. I'll try. I'll wait. Xander. No, forget it. I'm not him. I, mean, I guess the guy's got to be undead to make time with you. That's really harsh. I'm not stupid. This is apocalypse stuff. I'd throw in last night's earthquake and I'd say we've got a problem. Angel and Giles working together was great. Everyone is so concerned for Buffy and oh, I, I, I get it. But also just this feeling of mistrust that she has. I get that too. Fully, I understand, like, that's what I mean about this being well written because you can understand everyone's motivations, right? Tomorrow night, Buffy will face the master and she will die. One Slayer dies, next one's called. Are you even gonna tell me? I was hoping that I wouldn't have to, that there was some way around it. I... I've got a way around it. I quit. I know this is hard. What do you know about this? You're never gonna die. You think I want anything to happen to you, huh? Do you think I could stand it? We just gotta figure out a way. I already did. I quit, remember? Pay attention. And now we have Buffy in act of desperation as she is absolutely begging with her mum to just escape because she knows the peril that's actually coming. She knows all of the dangers, everything that's going to happen. But her mum obviously is fixated on trying to create a solid footing for them, a place to call home. And the fact of the matter is that with Buffy not being able to tell the truth and not knowing how her mum will react, <laughs> a bit of foreshadowing there, it just shows the issues that will just lead to worse things later on. But I do like the genuine when olive branch has been given with this dress here plus it's so cute this is perfect nighted dress we all have to admit it this is gorgeous as well as the one to actually come across the bodies of the people that she knew um just bringing the gravity of the situation and kind of setting the tone for later seasons as well because things have been kind of like black and white easy to understand but as the show goes on it does get a lot more gray let's say. It wasn't our world anymore. They made it theirs. And they had fun. Giles wants to fight on Buffy's behalf, but of course, nope, and then she does this. I defy prophecy and I'm going. There's nothing you can say will change my mind. I know. <clears throat> you fight the master and you'll die. Maybe. Maybe I'll take him with me. Xander goes to find Angel and threatens him unless he goes and helps Buffy. The battle with the master. Ooh, their candle budget is very high, by the way. My gosh, I'm jealous. The feeble banter portion of the fight. Why don't we just cut to the... Nice shot. But prophecies are tricky creatures. They don't tell you everything. You're the one that sets me free. The power! And by the way, I like your dress. Then when Angel finds her, like, my heart, every time, even if I've seen this like three times or whatever, it's just like, oof. And then Xander saves her life because, of course, Angel doesn't breathe in a normal way. I have no breath. Welcome back. Oh no, we've got hentai tentacles. Oh no, oh dear. Buffy is forever changed after this experience, of course, and I like the fact that they actually address that as opposed to her just being okay with stuff. They actually include the fact that, hey, this would affect people psychologically. So how do you know where the master's going? Oh no. And when I saw the monster, all I thought of was Audrey 2 from The Little Shop of Horrors. Be Missy Mole. 
I feel more sorry for you if you don't understand that reference because Howard Ashman, um, you're missing out. And of course we're back to 90s cheesiness. The weight of this is kind of diminished for me personally, but at the same time, I still appreciate cheesiness, so I'm gonna let it slide. It's still a really good finale. You're that amped about hell? Go there. Your mouth is closed. Buffy? Buffy? Oh, sorry. It's just been a really weird day. Yeah, Buffy died and everything. Wow, harsh. Should have known that wouldn't stop you. We save the world. I say we party. I mean, I got all pretty. What about him? He's not going anywhere. If you made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. Please do tell me what is your favourite episode because oh, there's a few good ones but there's a fair few rotten ones as I said as well. Season 1 I feel like they're definitely trying to find their feet. Season 2 they're, they're still sort of getting there but I do kind of prefer it personally. So that's what we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks. I'm doing this as a seven part series so we'll be carrying on until December. I hope you enjoyed this sort of like fun watch party with me and as you know the themes do get deeper from now on so I'm really Really excited to unpack that and thank you all so so much for watching i really do appreciate it bye